Good morning. It is wonderful to see you this morning. I uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, the Lord has given us an absolute beautiful, beautiful day this morning. Uh, so I am so happy uh, that you are with us this morning. Before we begin, let's do a quick couple of quick announcements. Um, this past week, we had canceled everything on Wednesday night due to uh, our spring break and so many people traveling, but we will resume everything this Wednesday night. So Pastor Gary's midweek service, they meet over in the fellowship hall at 6.30. The teens meet in the youth room at 6 p.m. And then Kids for Truth, uh, we've got about five weeks left. We meet over in the kids' chapel, uh, and that starts at 6.30 as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started a couple times a year doing what we call a village lunch. Uh, and that is this afternoon right after the morning service. And that is for anybody that has kids. Uh, you are welcome to stay for lunch with us today. Uh, today is chicken strips and french fries. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, you'd like to stay and join us for lunch today, we would love to have you uh, come and join us today. Senior Saints, they're having a get-together on the 25th of April. Uh, that's a covered dish. You'll get more information about that in the next uh, couple of weeks. We do have a couple of Bible studies that meet on campus. If you're interested in joining one of those, uh, some ladies Bible studies that meets on Tuesday, men meet on Friday. So again, if you have any questions, you can see me about that afterwards. Uh, a couple of things coming up at the beginning of May. Uh, the first one is a men's outing. Uh, this year, we're, we try every year or so to go down to a baseball game. We've done several in our area. Uh, this year, we will be going over to uh, Zebulon, North Carolina, <clears throat> excuse me, to see the Carolina Mudcats. Uh, and that is on May 4th. Tickets are $12, uh, and you can sign up on our website uh, for that. And then the next day, May 5th, that is our Healthcare Workers Appreciation Sunday. And so if you remember, last year we did it for uh, police officers, firefighters, and so forth. Uh, this year we're doing healthcare workers. And so we would love to have you come and join us for that. If you are in the healthcare industry, uh, you can go on the website and sign up to attend uh, lunch that day. And then also there's some cards on the back table. Uh, if you have friends or when you, if you have appointments and you want to invite your uh, doctors and, and nurses to come on that Sunday, um, we would love to have you do that. There's some cards back there that you can pass out uh, to invite your friends. Again, they sign up on the website. We'll do a special service that morning and then as well have lunch for them over in the fellowship hall uh, that afternoon. So please uh, take advantage of that, sign up, and then invite others to be able to come as well. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we will start our worship. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for allowing us to be here today, to hear a message from your word in just a few moments, to join together in singing as we worship you through song and, and look at some of your characteristics and, and, and attributes in music, and we thank you for that. We thank you for our time this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to begin our worship uh, this morning by asking God to adjust our hearts and adjust our minds so that we can approach him and offer him worship in spirit and in truth. That's what this song means when it says, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Let's stand as we sing, come thou fount. Yes. 
Worship is not a one-way conversation. It's a dialogue. It's not just something that we offer God, but it's also where we open our hearts to hear what he, what he has to say to us. And this next song is asking God to do that, to speak to our hearts through our worship and through the word that is preached. Speak, O Lord. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen. to have several Sundays a year where we feature just congregational singing, and today was a good day to do that. So today, you're the choir, you're the soloist, so sing out and minister to the people around you with your wholehearted worship, and if you do that, then you will be fulfilling Colossians 3.16 that Pastor preached on not too long ago, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So uh, having said that, I don't want to wear your legs out, though, so we have a lot of congregational singing, so I'm going to let you have a seat as we sing this next song, There Is a Redeemer. (laughs) 
continue to sing about our Redeemer as it's still the Easter season of the year. You may say to yourself, I didn't know there was an Easter season, I thought it was just one Sunday, but every Sunday is the Easter season. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, amen? Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, amen? Amen, all right, that was better. Uh, let's let's stand back up. It's amazing how much better you sing when you're standing up. I'm I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, let's let's sing it together. Across the land.
Thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your
is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all jesus your name is the highest your name is the greatest your Your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, oh, holy, all creation cries, oh, holy, you are lifted high, oh, holy, holy Great singing, you may be seated. Today, we're so glad to have you with us here this morning. If this is your first time here at Grace, uh, we always take this moment in our service to greet you and thank you for joining us. Um, if this is your first time here in our ministry today, we would ask you to take a moment or two before you leave and fill out. Our guest card, you can access it by scanning the QR code that's printed on the small card in the pew in front of you. It looks just like the one that's on the screen behind me. And when you scan that, it'll take you to a place where you can tell us a little bit about yourself. You can also submit any questions you may have about our ministry, and we would be glad to answer those for you. And as always, you can visit our website as well, gracenc.org, and get some of those questions answered as well. Um, also, in regard to the guest card and also a couple things coming up here at Grace, uh, next Sunday morning at 9.15, um, I will be teaching our next starting point class. If you are praying and thinking about joining Grace, uh, we would love to have you come and be a part of that class again. I want to say the time again is at 9.15. That's 15 minutes earlier than our normal connect group time. And so we'll be meeting in the high school building next Sunday morning at 9.15. If you're interested in more information about uh, joining Grace, if you are planning to come to the class, you can use the QR code can scan that and, and email us, send it in to us to let us know that you're coming. We would appreciate that. Or you can also call the office and let us know if you're planning to be um, in that class. I also wanted one more time just to mention the uh, Healthcare Sunday that is coming up that was already mentioned by Pastor Brian, but I want to underscore that and uh, encourage you to be inviting uh, people that you know that are currently serving in the healthcare industry or have in the past. And uh, we're hoping to minister to them in a very special way um, on May the 5th, and so let me encourage you to uh, participate in that by inviting uh, those that you know, neighbors, friends, um, strangers, it doesn't matter. If they're in healthcare, uh, if you can invite them, we would, we would very much appreciate that. Uh, part of the ministry here at Grace uh, Baptist Church, a very important part of our ministry um, historically, um, has been the aspect of missions. And uh, local missions, obviously being a part of that, but also foreign missions. And part of the vision of grace from the very beginning was to make sure that we had a very active uh, missions program that was not just centered locally, but also had an impact um, around, around the world. Um, in fact, I didn't know this. I didn't know this until just a couple of weeks ago when we had uh, the Anchorage camp here with us for a Sunday night, and the ladies, you were with a couple of different ministries, but the men uh, spent some time <clears throat> with the leadership at, Anch at the Anchorage. I did not know this. I was unaware of this. I knew that we had always had a great relationship with the Anchorage, and they've been very close to us and supportive of us, as we have of them. Um, but the Anchorage camp 
which is ministering right now to hundreds of kids throughout the summer, uh, increasing having other camps that they do throughout the year. Our school goes there for camp. I did not know this until a couple of weeks ago that uh, the Anchorage camp was on the verge of bankruptcy, and they were going to close their doors. They were done. They had no more money. They couldn't afford to stay open. And our ministry, Grace Baptist Church, uh, gave them, as in to be paid back, but gave them money, $150,000, to keep the camp open. And the camp got through that very difficult financial time, and there it is today. And so I say that to say that missions has always been a part um, of what we do here at Grace. And uh, we have one of our missionaries with us today, and I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Um, but one of the things that we like to do is have our missionaries, when they are in the States or they are local, to come and to speak for us. Uh, but before I introduce him and we show a video, actually, in just a moment, I did want to read just a text of Scripture. Pastor Wes mentioned this before the song. One song he said about every Sunday being a resurrection Sunday. And I started thinking back to the reality that sometimes we think the resurrection of Christ, obviously a profoundly important moment um, in, in history, but that wasn't even the end of Jesus's ministry to his followers after that. There was still instruction that happened. And most of you are probably familiar very much so with these verses, um, but I want to read them for you. It's in Matthew 28. It's called the Great Commission. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Now, remembering worship is only to be ascribed to God. And so here, ascribing Christ as God in the flesh. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, that God is calling people from every nation, every tribe. And he says that we are to go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. One of the partnerships that we have at Grace with the missionaries that we support is the financial support. And I always like to take these moments just briefly to uh, just to let you know how we fund the missionaries that we support. A lot of churches, uh, when you give money to the general, general offering, general giving, that a portion for many churches, a portion of that is set aside for missions. The way grace has worked for, since its inception, has worked is that, actually, I think it might not, this might not have always been true, but it has been true definitely for the last 20, 30 years, is that we set aside money above and beyond our offering, which goes to the mission. Okay, it's been called grace giving in the past. And so when, when missionary comes and you see them, you hear them, you meet them, understanding that we, when we give to missions through grace, you're a part of their ministry. You are partners with them. You are allowing them to do what God has called them to do. And so we are partnering with them financially, but also partnering with them um, in prayer, which is also obviously a very important part of our partnership. So today we have Josh and Amy Jensen with us. They are ministering in Cambodia, and uh, they have been in Cambodia uh, for a very long time, 10 years, for 10 years, and they've been ministering there, and uh, great ministry, and, and uh, Josh is going to come tell us a little bit about the ministry, introduce his ministry a little more to us, and also preach for us today. Uh, but before Josh comes and challenges us from Scripture, we have a video uh, that we're going to show and it'll introduce the Jensen family a little bit more to you. We are the Jensens, your missionaries in Northeast Cambodia. Josh. Amy. Becca. Rosaya. Anna. Claire. Erica. Martha. Maria. Cambodia sits on the Southeast Asian peninsula nestled between Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. Our primary ministry in Cambodia is to assist Jirai tribal churches through Bible translation and Bible teaching. 
In our previous six years of doing translation work, we've completed and published Ruth and Jonah, Matthew, large portions of Genesis and Exodus, and most recently we finished Acts, which is being printed this year. We've nearly completed 1 Timothy and Philemon. In this next term, we'll be working on Mark, Luke, and Romans before moving on to other New Testament books. Translation is a big job, not just because the Bible has a lot of verses in it, more than 31,000, but because every verse goes through a careful six-step process of translation. First, our local Jirai translators translate the verse from Khmer, the national Cambodian language, into Jirai, looking at three to five Khmer translations. Second, I check the verse against the Greek or Hebrew, also looking at other translations in English and Khmer, making revisions for both accuracy and clarity. During this step, I always work with one of our Jirai translators. In the third step, our team of five Jirai translators read the translated text a chapter at a time and discuss among themselves problems they find, usually awkward wordings or verses that aren't clear. They then present their suggested revisions to me, and we work through each problem together. In the fourth step, one or two team members reads the text with Jirai speakers outside of our team to check for comprehension problems. In the fifth step, our translation committee, made up of Jirai church leaders, meets for however many days it takes to read the text together and discuss any questions or suggestions they have. For the sixth and final step, we translate the Jirai text back into English so that an outside consultant can evaluate the text, ask questions to the team and Jirai speakers outside the team, and suggest revisions. Once the consultant check is finished for an entire book, the text is ready for publication. Along the way, we add cross-references, write needed footnotes, and prepare maps, as well as adding terms to our glossary, which is printed at the back of each book. Once the book is published, another missionary makes a recording of our translators reading the book out loud to include in our phone app. While mass-producing newly translated books of the Bible for reading is a simple process, mass-producing students of God's Word is not. We devote significant effort to finding ways to help churches, small groups, and individual Christians actually read, study, and think about the new Jirai translation, being confident that the Spirit of God will use the Word to transform the hearts and lives of His people. The men's, women's, and youth Sunday school groups in our Jirai church are now studying Matthew. Each week they read through a paragraph and discuss the section verse by verse. They are slowly becoming students of the Word. I've written tunes for many Bible verses to help both children and adults memorize God's Word. I meet with a few different Jirai women every week to read the Bible with them. The work is slow, but it's exciting to see the fruit from these reading times as the women start to understand the Word. One extra ministry that we know you've prayed for is our weekly Khmer Bible study on Sunday nights. Over the past four years, we've seen two Khmer neighbors choose to follow Christ through baptism, Davi first, and then her nephew, Bao. Besides Sunday nights, they each meet with Josh or me to read the Bible every week. <laughs> ไล่ขยับมันกําปีเนี่ยแม่ก็อยู่จุดเด้ก็บ่ต่อจนก็บ่ต่อแล้วก็จุดกะมันปัดๆปิ่งๆมาพัดปิ่งเอ็นตัว
cấp mẹ môn ta chia xong nua như tay lệ dợ dợ như là nền nhà Thank you for your prayers and support for us over these last 10 years. Please pray for us especially that we would find creative and effective ways to help Jirai people incorporate the newly translated scriptures into their worship, their study, their discipleship, and their evangelism. It's a... Uh... Real pleasure to be here this morning. Thanks to the folks here at uh, Grace Baptist for your faithful support for us, your faithful prayers for us. I know that there are members here who regularly are reading our updates, praying specifically for us. I was just with the Pathfinders before coming in here every week. Um, those wonderful folks are praying for our prayer requests. And we know there are people who are here in the congregation who are doing the same. Thank you very much for that. Before we open the word, I want to tell you right there at the back of the, um, of the worship center here, we have an update list. If you want to get our email updates, which we send out approximately every two to three months, you can uh, put your email address on here. And uh, you can also find our prayer card and uh, see if you can learn everybody's name. I carry it with me everywhere I go, just to rehearse. Um, I'm going to be preaching this morning from... Uh, Matthew, thank you, Pastor, for reading the Great Commission to us this morning, because the Great Commission really encapsulates what we're doing. We're not planting churches as our main goal. Our main goal is to translate the Bible, but that is Great Commission work, because the Great Commission is about what? Making disciples. And how do you make a disciple? Well, someone comes to faith and is baptized, and then that person is taught to do what? to obey everything Jesus commanded. And that's a heart issue, right? It's not just outward obedience. But how can you obey all the things Jesus commanded without having his words in a form that you can understand? We're going to be looking this morning at the Lord's Prayer. I've put it in its uh, traditional kind of older uh, form up on the board. But I'm going to be preaching not from uh, this, but from this. This is our Jirai uh, translation of the book of Matthew. And I'm going to be translating it back into English because I want to give you a sense of what uh, kind of the work that goes into translation and how different a translation might sound in another language while still maintaining the same meaning. So we're going to talk through uh, very briefly uh, each of the petitions, each of the parts of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, why don't we just go through it in English uh, first? So, the Lord's Prayer goes like this. We're all familiar with it, I think. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, when Jesus introduced this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, here's what he said. I'm going to read this. Uh, in Jir I'll read it in Jirai first, just so you can hear what Jirai sounds like. Ning nun ye, bui go i. Y'all lie, plane. Jesus said, so then, y'all should pray, so it's a plural there, y'all should pray like this. Now, we're Baptists, so we're not, you know, some of us might have come from backgrounds where people pray set prayers. We don't really do that as Baptists, but we should remember that Jesus did give this as a prayer to teach us how to pray. This is, in fact, a biblical model that we can use in our own praying. So don't be afraid of the Lord's Prayer as though it's kind of this dead formalism or it's not going to come from your heart. It comes from our Savior's heart. And so if we understand it, we can pray it from our own hearts. Let's look at this uh, one line at a time. I put right in the middle there, so at the top is the Jirai 
in uh, their own script. And then in the middle is a very literal translation of that back into English. And at the bottom, I've put the traditional form that you'd be used to seeing this in, in English. So in Jirai, it sounds something like, our father who lives in the far sky. So this sounds different, right? Like what's the word sky doing there instead of heaven? Well, in Greek, the same word is used for the heaven where God dwells and the sky that you see when you look up. So in translation, we actually talked about this. Do we need to distinguish these two things? Jirai only has one word, sky. Do we need to have a special word for heaven? Well, Greek doesn't have a special word for heaven and Hebrew doesn't have a special word for heaven. So actually, Jirai is more like the original languages than English where we distinguish those things. Of course, we understand that sky does have a special meaning though. Why do we talk about, why does Jesus talk about the Father who lives in the sky above? It's because just as the sky is above the earth, so God is above his creation. God is Lord of everything. Now, notice what else? What do we call God in this prayer? We call him, we call him our Father, right? So this is the normal way for Christians to pray. Never think that praying, dear Heavenly Father, or dear Father in Heaven, is somehow a, an inadequate way to begin your prayer. In the Old Testament, uh, Father, the, the, God is typically addressed as Lord, often with a special Hebrew um, word that we translate as Lord. But Jesus teaches us to address God in prayer as our Father. Now, something interesting about this, something I've wondered before and have was thinking about as I was preparing this message. Why is it, how do we end our prayers? If we're thinking about the beginning, how do we normally end our prayers? Often in Jesus' name, amen. And you notice that in the Lord's prayer here, we don't have those words in Jesus' name. But what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? It means that we're praying with the authority of Jesus, with the authorization of Jesus, we can come to the Father because Jesus, as the way to the Father, has made a way for us to go to the Father in prayer. So we should think about how did Jesus always pray in the Gospels? He always says, Father, my Father. So when we're praying the Lord's Prayer, we're praying like Jesus. We can only call God Father, because we come to him through his son, Jesus. When we pray our Father, we're praying with Jesus to his Father, and because of Jesus, our Father. Now, for the dry people in their traditional religion, they uh, don't have a Father in heaven. They have spirits who are all around them, and when bad things happen to them, they have to appease a spirit a sacrifice, but they don't have a personal relationship with the spirit. Uh, the spirits don't love them or judge them. Uh, the spirits aren't holy or just or good. There's nothing in Jirai culture like this prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples. So this prayer is itself a way that we can teach Jirai people about who their father is. Who made them? Who wants to be in a relationship with them? Who wants them to, to address him as their father? Okay, so as we move into the next three lines of the Lord's Prayer, uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I used to think that these were um, not requests, but praise. And I've sometimes heard it said, that uh, the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples is not about us, but it's about God. And that's true. But it is also true that these are, in fact, requests. In all of these three lines, we are asking our Father in heaven to do something. And we're not just asking something for him, 
as you'll see, we're also asking something for us. So as we go through these three lines, I hope that'll become clear. The first of these petitions, the first of these requests, uh, we're used to saying, hallowed be thy name. In Jirai, it's a little bit longer. We say, uh, let all people uh, make something like make famous your holy name or spread abroad your holy name. Well, that sounds very different from hallowed be thy name, doesn't it? Let's start, and this is, I actually appreciated that uh, the last song we sang uh, in worship before uh, coming to the word, uh, what were we singing? We were singing about God's name. All the angels say what? Holy. All creation says what? Holy. Now, here's a problem. All the angels do say holy. All creation does not yet say holy. So let's think about God's name and what it means for God's name to be hallowed. Okay, in Jirai, uh, one of our problems in translation is that they have a word that means face, like the face on the front of your head, and that same word is used to mean name. So uh, you could say that person has an ugly name. I actually heard someone say this once, and I thought he was saying his wife had an ugly face, but what he meant his or her parents had named her after some forest animal that happens to be a very ugly animal. So he was just commenting on what an unfortunate name she had. I thought he was saying, My, I have an ugly wife. Um, so we, didn't, we don't want that happening in our translation where people, where we mean name, they think face. Um, so we're not talking about God's clean or holy face. So that's one reason that in Jirai, this is such a long petition. Let people make famous your holy name. You don't make famous someone's face, but you can make famous someone's name. Now, what is a name? Well, I think that in this prayer, God's name is his reputation. We'll sometimes say that about a company. They have a bad name, right? They have a bad reputation. So this is what God's reputation is what is known and believed about God. So we're praying that that will be hallowed. Let's think about the English word hallow. Um, so remember, in, when we pray this in English, we say hallowed be thy name. It almost sounds like we're saying something is already true, but this is a request. It's, we're saying may your name be hallowed. So we've translated this in Jirai as let all people Read your name as holy or make famous your name as holy. What does this word hallow mean? In English, we, only ha we pretty much only use it in the word Halloween, uh, which is for the night before All Saints Day. The word saint is related to, the, is, means holy, a holy person. So hallowing has to do with holiness. It basically means to make something special or to treat it as special. The first thing that's hallowed in the Bible, can you think of it? The first thing that's hallowed in the Bible is in Genesis 2, when God rests on the seventh day, in older translations it says, he hallowed the seventh day, the Sabbath. What does that mean? It means he made it special. He made the seventh day different from every other day, set it apart as a day of rest. So the Sabbath, starting at the very beginning, the Sabbath is a special day because of God's declaration. But in the law, in the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment is what? That we should hallow the Sabbath. How can you hallow something that's already hallowed? How can you make something holy that's already holy? If God, if God made the Sabbath holy, can we make it holier? Well, we can't. So there it means when people hallow the Sabbath, what are they doing? They're treating it as special. They're treating it for what it really is because God has already made it that way. So let's bring that back to God's name. God's name is already the name above every name. God's name is already holy. So how can we make his name holy? Well, we can treat his name 
for what it really is. We can treat his name as holy. We can make him known as a holy God, as a good God, as the God of all creation. So when we're praying this, we're praying that people, including ourselves, will know and speak the truth about God. We are praying that God's reputation in the world and here in Wilmington would match who he really is. It's possible for God to have a bad reputation. And you know how he gets a bad reputation? Often from us. So when we're, because we are marked out by God's name, we bear God's name. If you were baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you bear God's name in your body. So you're carrying around God's reputation. So when we pray this, we're praying for ourselves that we would live and speak in a way that helps rather than hurts God's reputation. Hallowed be thy name. All right, the second petition we know as thy kingdom come. We translate this as let your rule of the earth arrive. Now, why do we translate it that way? Well, this Greek word that means kingdom, it can mean either a realm or a reality. So the realm of God's kingdom or any kingdom, it could be a kingdom here on earth, would be the country that's ruled by a king, a piece of property. The reality of a kingdom is the king's rule or authority in his realm. So in this prayer, we're not praying that a piece of real estate would show up here on earth. We're praying that God's ruling in the earth would become more and more of a reality. This was a challenge in our translation because Jirai people have, in the past, Dry Christians have been using a translation. Uh, we work in Cambodia. They were using a translation that came from Vietnam in a different dialect of Jirai that was very, very difficult to understand. In that translation, the kingdom, the word kingdom is translated as country. Um, and so they always assumed that God's kingdom was a particular place. And in particular, they confused it with heaven as the place you go when you die. So when they prayed about God's kingdom, they were basically thinking of where I go when I die. But obviously, that's not what this is talking about, since we're praying for something to arrive here on earth. So what we're praying here is for God's rule on earth to become a reality. We're praying evangelistically. We're praying that God's enemies unsaved people would submit to Jesus' rule and become his subjects, the citizens of his kingdom. We're praying for the extension of his kingdom as more and more people here in Wilmington, throughout North Carolina, in Cambodia, bow the knee to King Jesus and believe the gospel. But we're also praying for ourselves, for Jesus' subjects, people who already believe. You could, if the other one is praying for the ex, 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 extension of his kingdom, we're also praying for the intensification of his kingdom. We're praying that we, his subjects, will obey him. Jesus is our king, and he makes the rules for how we do church, how we spend our money, who can marry whom, what we look at on our cell phones or our televisions, whether or not we count children as a blessing to be embraced or a drag on our aspirations, all of these have to do with God's rule in our lives. The things I just listed, those applications, are all things that we're trying to teach the dry church about, money, Kids, entertainment, they have the same kinds of struggles that Americans here in America have, just in different kinds of houses in a different climate. All right, let's move on. The third petition is, 
uh, your will be done, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We translate this as let what you want be done here on earth like in the sky above. Okay, so you see the word sky again, but of course we're thinking about God's space. This distinction between sky and earth or heaven and earth, pay attention to this when you're reading your Bibles. It starts at the very beginning, like the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and this heaven earth pairing, you can follow it all the way through the Bible, right to the book, right to Revelation. And one of the things you should notice when you see heaven and earth together is that heaven, God's space, is the model for earth. Even before sin came, God was making earth more and more like heaven. So heaven is the model, earth is God's workspace. So what does it mean that God's will should be done on earth as it is in heaven? Is there anything God wants to do that he's incapable of doing? Like something is keeping God from doing what he really wants to do? Not, not, it's not as though in heaven God can do what he wants, but here on earth somehow he can't. But what happens in heaven that doesn't happen here on earth? All the angels and all the departed saints always obey everything God wants them to do, right? There was disobedience in heaven once, and God ended that, and there will never be again. But on earth, is it true? Can we say that here on earth, everybody always does what God wants them to do? Do you always do what God wants you to do? I don't. What we're praying here is that here on earth, people would do what God wants them to, just like is done in heaven. So again, we're praying for people here, for God's glory, but we're praying for ourselves. That we would order our lives and our churches and our families and our businesses and our politics, everything according to God's wishes which are revealed where? How do we know what God's wishes are? They're revealed in God's word. His incarnate word, Jesus Christ, his word that became flesh, and his written word, that's why we translate the Bible, his written word, the Bible. That's how we know what God wants. Now, of course, you could read the Bible, and it does you absolutely no good because none of us in ourselves have the power the ability to do what God wants. Who gives us that ability? That's right, the Holy Spirit. And remember I said we should, when we think about heaven and earth, and earth becoming more like heaven, we should go all the way back to the beginning. Verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, who's there? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. From the very beginning, God has sent his Spirit down to the earth to make the earth more like heaven, to do this work of recreating the earth, creating and then recreating the earth, and recreating us so that we are agents of God's will here on earth. It's the Spirit's work, not our own. Okay, I'm going to go a little faster now, but this one's a little bit tough because it's so weird in our dry translation. Uh, we're used to saying, give us this day our daily bread, which is a good literal translation of the Greek. But what's missing from the Jirai translation? It says, give us enough to eat for today. What's missing there? The word bread, right? So this was a struggle for us. I'm still not happy about this. But at this point, this is what our translation says. Because in Cambodia, the staple food is rice. Every meal has rice. If you don't have rice, you haven't eaten. You could have a steak, but you'd still be hungry for rice if you didn't have rice with it. I mean, that is literally true. Uh, for Jews in Jesus' time, going all the way back to Moses' time, what was the staple food? Bread. Like, you might eat other things, but you always ate bread. Always ate bread. So bread stands for your basic needs, the thing you've got to have to keep living. For Jirai, that's not bread. 
Uh, bread is a snack food. Kids will bug their parents and say, I want to buy some bread. And it's just like, you know, it's, I mean, they, they know about bread. They know Americans eat bread. It's not a staple food for us either. We didn't want to say, give us this day our daily rice, because like, they didn't eat rice back then. So we took the general category, what bread stands for, and put what, give us enough to eat. So that people know when they're praying that they're not praying for the yummy extras, they're praying for their necessities. Now by not having the word bread in there, we lose some things, we lose connections with Jesus as the bread of life, with the manna in the wilderness, and those are unfortunate losses. What we gain is a clear understanding of what it is we're praying for. We're not praying for literal bread, we're praying for our, our literal needs to be met. Now, you and I, we don't pray, well, I, I am now praying this, but we don't think to pray that God would give us enough to eat today, right? Most of us don't. Most of us, like, you, it's in your pantry. Why would you pray for what's already in your pantry? I think it would be good for us to pray this, though, because it would remind us that even with our insurance policies and our bank accounts and our credit limits and our social security, even with all that, you laugh when I say social security. So, well, our social safety net, we actually rely on whom to meet our needs every day. We rely on God every day to have enough to eat, even if we don't realize it. And it also reminds us, if we're praying for daily bread, enough to eat today, that there are only a few things that are really essential, like food, clothes, shelter, medical care. Like there aren't most of the things we think about all day and we work for are good extras. They're blessings from God, but they're not necessities. And it's good to remind ourselves of that. Next comes this prayer for forgiveness. Clear away the wrongs we do as we clear people who do wrong with us also. I won't say much about this except that for dry people, there's not this sense of sinning against the spirit. So their word for wrong is something that's always done, I can do wrong against my wife or my children or my neighbor. There's no sense that you could, that you could sin against the spirit. And so part of what it means to teach a dry person the personal, um, the personal relationship we have with God is that we can sin against God just like we sin against people. And we need to be forgiven by God. And the Greek word here is actually forgive us our debts. When our sin actually puts us in debt to God, and we cannot repay that debt. But God's own son repaid that debt for us. And receiving that forgiveness puts on us an obligation, an obligation to forgive other people's debts, to forgive other people's sins against us. And this is a hard sell for Jirai people who solve many of their interpersonal problems by suing one another. They don't go to court, they just have village gatherings. And sometimes people will sue people in their own family. Sometimes parents-in-law will sue their son-in-law. And I, you know, we think, well, that hurts your daughter, but it's just, it's their culture. And the whole concept of forgiving one another, letting an offense, recognizing an offense, saying that was bad, and saying, I forgive you. I'm not going to hold that against you. I'm not going to sue you. I'm not going to fine you for that. That's the work of the Spirit. It's what children of God do. Don't lead us into the temptation of the evil spirit. Help us be delivered from him. I'm not going to talk about this one, except to say that our biggest problem is sin. Our biggest problem isn't our daily bread. Our biggest problem isn't uh, retirement. Our biggest problem uh, isn't even our health. Our biggest problem is sin. God solved that problem through Jesus, but it's an ongoing problem because we have an enemy who continues to tempt us to sin, 
And we pray against that. We pray for God not to lead us into temptation, but to deliver us from the evil one. And we simply, it's simply not honest to pray like this and then ourselves walk into temptation knowingly. And you can't say, God, don't lead me into temptation and then go there ourselves on purpose. So if we pray this prayer, we should also be willing to take some action ourselves. For example, canceling a streaming service if we need to, or changing the channel, or shutting down a social media account, or plucking out an eye. Jesus said that. Or getting a dumb phone. Some people need to get a dumb phone. Or quitting a ball team. Or changing majors or changing schools. Or Jesus said, chopping off a hand. Right? I think Jesus was speaking metaphorically, but he said, Jesus meant, take action. Don't lead yourself into temptation. Now, the prayer ends like this. Because your ruling and your divine power and your glory remain forever. Amen. This is the prayer that Jesus gave as a model for our prayers. I think that we should not only pray like this, we should also pray this actual prayer, but from the heart with understanding. You can use, I use this prayer sometimes as a, like a line at a time. I'll pray a line, and then I'll think about what it means and add additional requests connected to that particular line. Maybe when you pray for God's name to be hallowed, you could pray for your church and the people in your church. Because God's reputation in Wilmington depends in part on this church. When you pray for God's kingdom, you could pray for your missionaries and for church planters and for the anchorage because their work, our work, is bringing God's kingdom to people and bringing people into God's kingdom. So you can pray the prayer like that. And actually praying this prayer is one of the ways that God makes his name known to us and to others. It's one of the ways that he exercises his kingly rule in our lives and in the lives of our families. It's one of the ways that he takes our will, what we want, and brings it into alignment with his own will so that his will will be done on earth here as it's done in heaven above. Would you just recite this prayer? Actually, don't just recite it. Pray it from your heart with me. We'll pray it the traditional way because that's so familiar to us. So I'm going to put it on the screen. Pray this slowly with me uh, as we end our sermon. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate your careful explanation and, and, and sharing with us today. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I wanted to just mention a couple of, a couple of I think, important observations that I, I hope to get you to think about with me um, for just a moment. Um, first, we have to understand that languages change over time. Languages are different. Words change. New words are created. Every year, right, there's new year, new words that make it into our dictionary because those words didn't exist before. And so the need for ongoing translation is a very important part. You know, I, I heard this joke years ago. I think it's kind of funny. You might not. But it said, what do you call someone who speaks three languages? Three languages. They they, they're trilingual. 
What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What's someone who speaks one language? An American. We, because we speak English, we know English, we think English, most of the world, to some degree, kind of caters to English, we forget foolishly. There are people in the world who cannot speak, read, understand English. Language is different. It changes. American English is different than British English. We took a mission trip to France. We took a lady with us from Montreal who spoke French, uh, Canadian French. We took her to speak French French. And she could do it, but it wasn't the same. Think about Viet, Viet, uh, a translation in Vietnam and Vietnamese. Translating that to a Cambodian language, they're not the same. There may be similarities, but they're not the same. So the first thing I wanted us to just remember is that language changes. Number two, meaning is what meaning that is that is faithful to the text is what we're after. Okay, I loved what he said about give us this day our daily bread. That makes no sense to parts of the world. No sense. I, I, I did this on purpose. When I was in Haiti, I was talking to one of the Haitians who spoke English, and I said to him, he, he made a, a, a wisecrack to me or something, and I smacked him on the arm, and I said, man, you threw me under the bus. And Harold was with us, and we were walking by the bus that Harold was fixing, and the Haitian looked under, and he said, what's under the bus? No concept. So here's where I'm going with this. When people say we want a literal translation of the Bible, no, you don't. You wouldn't be able to understand it because you're going from Greek into English, and, and Josh alluded to this. There are words that don't translate well. So I, I get excited about this. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one, but I, I think understanding that the meaning of the text and getting it right for that culture, for that language, is what we are what we are after. Now, number three is the most important. And I'm struggling because I can't read my own handwriting here, but here's what it says, I think. I'm translating my own handwriting. Um, Translation matters for the gospel to be taught. We are so used to, I get asked this question from time to time, which English translation is the best? Which Janai translation is the best? There's one. <laughs> right? And so we have this mindset, well, I don't like that translation or that translation, so I'm going to pick this one, and this one's got to be superior to that one because for whatever reason, and we get into this inter, you know, inner squad argument over translation. Let me tell you something. Inside your Bible, you probably have never remotely looked at this, is something called a preference, a pre right? No, I said that wrong. Preface, a, a preference, a preface, okay? When you read that, do you know what's in this? Has anybody actually ever read it? You, don't be embarrassed if you haven't. Most people haven't. It tells you the translation philosophy of how the translation was done so that you can read and you're looking for words that you don't want to paraphrase. Those are helpful, but you want something that is a, not a literal translation, but a literary translation that understands the original language, that also understands meaning of the text into a particular culture, because what we want is for people to read the Bible, understand it, so they can live it. And we are spoiled in English. My dear friends in Cambodia, are in desperate need of the work that the Jensen's are doing, desperately. And so I hope today, if, if nothing else, that we are reminded of how, how important the wonderful treasure of Scripture is 
in our lives. If you go to my office right now, on my one shelf, I probably have 25 English Bibles, a Spanish Bible, and I have a Hebrew Bible, and I have a couple Greek, Greek, Greek Bibles. I have 25, 30 Bibles. There are people in the world who have access to none. And so if God's word is true, and I am convinced to the core of my soul that it is, part of our responsibility is to, is to support those who are making it possible for people like the Cambodians, like the Janai, to read in their language a text they can read, they can understand, so that they can come to Christ and get saved, and so that they then can go teach others, and you and I get to be a part of it when we support missionaries like the John. This was exciting to me. I love to see the diligence that they are doing to translate God's word into a language I'm guessing none of us here speak other than, other than John. It's a fabulous work, and I know they appreciate your support, and I appreciate it as well. Uh, before we leave today, Wes is going to come, and, and we're going to just end with a song in just a moment, but a couple of very quick reminder, reminders. Don't forget the village lunch today. The Jensen's will be there with us today. So if uh, you want to stick around and, and talk with them, we certainly would welcome you to do that. If you want to stop by their table on your way out, you can make sure that you do that um, as well. And then to keep this in the forefront of your mind, this year in October, uh, we are working on a missions emphasis weekend. And we're already working on the calendar for that. We're excited about that. And so a lot of things coming up in our missions program another missionary in a couple of weeks. Dave Rudolph will be with us in just a couple of weeks. So we're uh, trying to just keep this in front of everybody, uh, the importance of our missions program. So Wes, why don't you come and lead us in a closing song. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed Brother Jensen's message and pastor's comments, and I, I had some vague idea about adding some comments of my own about how all of that relates to music, which is also a language, but I'm not going to do that, okay, because it's 1146. Let's stand, and we will dismiss uh, today with this song, and I want you to really think as we do this that we are literally hallowing the name of our God as we sing. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all, all thrones. And dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high. Have a blessed week. You are dismissed.